So today is about uh, fundraising. And I know how hard it is because I've been an entrepreneur myself. Uh, I'm mostly a business angel now. Uh, and I've done all the mistakes in regards to, to startup funding. And I, I think that startup funding is so hard because for most people, they only do it once or twice. So it's not something you're not uh, experienced in. So that's why I think there's a lot of lessons learned from people that have done it before. So when we had to, to put together the program for tonight, we say, hey, we want to see it from different perspectives. So we have myself, I'm a business angel, so a former entrepreneur. Then we have Alexander, which is, uh, who is an um, investment manager at Precinct Ventures. So there you get the VC perspective. And then you have Peter Seeler, who is a very experienced entrepreneur. So we try to give uh, all perspective on this, focusing on from where we get the money and you know, basically some lessons learned. So, I'm a stage now. We have welcome from Crystal. Alexander's next. We had the very important beer break. We have Peter on stage, and we have a Q and A session. We actually made a small mistake here because we also have a Q and A session for Alexander. So, what we have is it worked quite well in the past. Is we have this Q and A app called Pigeonhole, and in there you can just fill in the questions you have to either Alexander or, or me or, or, or Peter and then we'll take it after each uh, presentation round, okay? So I'll try to give the sort of introduction to this. But it will be interesting to see how many of you have received funding from business angels in the past? From uh, VCs? Uh, public support, inner booster, something like that? Okay, so we have a match of people that know something and people that at least haven't done it in real life. So you'll have to, sorry to bear with me if I repeat some of the knowledge you have already. I think, oh yeah, that should have been up there. Sorry, it's, so the first thing I learned the hard way is that investors invest in different stages. So the most common mistakes that we all do is that we target those who invest very late or give you money very late. And that is, for instance, banks, we'll come back to that. So the first thing you have to be very clear on is where are you really? Are you on the team level? Are you on the prototype level? Do you have something launched where you have proven that it's a market demand? Do you have revenue? Do you have growth? Or if you, are you profitable? And it sounds so easy and basic, but it's actually one of the most common mistakes. And don't worry, over the next 15 minutes, I'll try to go into some of the usual suspects. I'll actually focus a lot on the early stage because I guess that not that many of you have revenue of X million euro, whatever. So what's happening over here is actually not that relevant. So I'll try to focus on these usual suspects, which is basically public support, friends and family, boonstrapping, angels, and some of the earlier investment funds. So the next thing I also learned the hard way is it's very different uh, raising money early stage and late stage. And by late stage, I could say it's a very successful daily startup that could be Unity and stuff like that, right? Imagine you're going to invest in Unity, right? And you ask for all these very detailed calculations on the custom acquisition cost, lifetime value, all these things. Which channel are you getting your customers from? How big is the market? How is the competitive situation? Honestly, they have all that. They have it because they've been in operations for 10 years. And then I could ask about the same in a startup I invest in early stage. Honestly, we don't have that. What we have is we think that customers are willing to pay $200. We think that the market will become big because it's actually not there now. We think we're much better in competition, but we don't really know because the competition is not there. With that being said, it's very different raising money. So the only thing you actually have as a startup founder is the trust in you. So when you're early stage, it's all about the trust in who you are. Because all the hockey stick calculations you have about the future, honestly, when we close the door, we don't believe in them, right? It's just, it's just a thing we make up. I can make a hockey stick for any of your startups. If you pay me $100, we do it afterwards, right? And it's, it's easy. So having early stage money, especially at the level where I invest, or where pre-seed ventures invest in their, in, their, in their grants. It's basically like, there's a reason why they call discovery loans. Because 
honestly, we are going to discover something. We don't really know. So why are they giving a discovery loan to this person and not that person? Most likely because there is some personal trust there. And that's really essential. Where in a really late stage company, I could believe that the CEO is really an asshole and I don't like him or her, but hey, I can see the data. Um, and due to that, it often starts with an uncle. So when you look into these uh, uh, unicorns or close to unicorns like Trustpilot, we, we hear about in the newspaper about that they raise $100 million or whatever, right? That's what we hear about. But then you should look into the cap table and see who were the first investor. The first investor in Peter's company was Peter's uncle that invested in 17,000 euro. And as I said, that happens in many, many cases. It doesn't have to be an uncle. It could be a neighbor. It can be a former colleague. It could be a former boss. It can be whatever. Why are they investing that early? Because they trust you. Because honestly, there was no data. So here, there was no data. There was a dream about doing something. Here, there was a ton of data. Right? So have that in mind that in the beginning, it often starts with someone that knows you. So then often it's people like me. So business analysts, which is just a fancy word for a private investor. And I think that many reasons why it's hard to explain what attracts a business analyst. The first reason is that it's a very diverse group of people. So this could be basically the members of Denban, you know, Danish Business Angel Association, Hero Head Copenhagen. That could basically be it. There are 150 members. And basically, you also represent them very, wide, uh, very good in, in, in terms of age. There are some that are 60 years old. There are some that have just made, sold their IT company, they're 30. Right? Some are ex-bankers, some are ex-CEOs, some have uh, got the money from the family, some are whatever. It's really a wide group of people. I think what many of them have in common is that we are very cynical about investing in angels, uh, investing in early stage startups. Honestly, for most of us, it doesn't make sense. Risk adjusted. So what is the chance that if I invest in a startup, what is the chance that it will become a success? Right? Are we saying 10%? Something like that. How long time will it take? 10 years. It's an illiquid asset, asset underway. And I will actually have to spend time on that. So most of us would be better off taking a regular job and spend the time on that uh, invest in any other asset class. So why do angels invest? In many cases because they of course want to do a good deal but they also want to do something else. Right? So when I have to convince an angel or when you have to convince an angel it's of course great to, to convey that it's a great business opportunity but what you really also have to say is why is it interesting for them? And that really depends. So we could have three different persons here. One is actually a retired banker who just think it would be fun to invest. One is really want to in, interested in curing uh, uh, cancer. Okay, that's another purpose. One wants to do something third. We are a very diverse group of people, but in general, what you have to, you have to speak to the heart and not only to the wallet if you want investors on board. One example, one of my investors in one of my first companies, he has a net worth of around uh, 2 billion Danish kroner. So if he invested in my startup and he was successful, he could maybe make 20 million kroner. 20 million kroner is a lot for me, maybe also for you. What is it for him? If he placed 2 billion, dollar, uh, 2 billion kroner in the stock market, he would most likely get 100 to 200 million a year without any sweat. Why, why, why should he invest? Most likely because of someone like this. It sounds so cliche, but the biggest mistake you can do is only to talk to this is a nice investment. So the good, that's a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that unlike 15 years ago, there's actually a lot of business angels out there. I think according to uh, Danish Business Angel Association, there are 4,000, I don't know how many, but there's at least several thousand people who on a regular basis are investing in startups. The problem is then who should you target? And what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't send them to all emails saying, would you please invest? Because then no one reply. 
So you need to be targeted. And my best advice is to focusing on two metrics. The one is, do the business angel understand the industry you're in? Because with all this lack of data, lack of traction, it's really, really hard to invest in anything. So I prefer to invest in industries I thought of no. So if you come to something that could be business to business software, I would really look into that, especially if it's in Denmark. If you come to me with an um, agriculture pro uh, project in Afghanistan, most likely I have no clue. But there might be people that actually work with that, right? So you need to target people that has information about the industry. The second thing is also about trust. Ideally, you know that person already, right? Ideally, you have built up this trust because that business angel is also your uncle. Next big thing is you, it comes with a recommendation. So some of my most interesting males are the ones that come from a trusted uh, uh, person of mine. That could be, for instance, someone from Seed Capital who said, Nikolai, this is a little bit too early for us or in a field that we don't really invest, but we think it's cool. Uh, these persons behind are really interesting. Uh, I think you should meet them. Guess what? I take the meeting, right? Even though it's in maybe in the yellow zone. So again, try to, un if you have a, how many of you are working with IT? Well, guess what? The, the business angel that you will get on board is a person that has invested in IT before. It is not a person that has only invested in property or bonds. If you, the same if you are in biotech, it's most likely a person that has experience from biotech. Um, so short about angel investment in Denmark, and I said in Denmark because 90% of all angel investments happen within a radius of 100 kilometers because we want to be there, we want to help. I made one investment in Slovenia, I'll never do it again. Why? Because when something happens and they say, you know, I, I can't really help them, right? So, classic business angel around Denmark will be half a million to two million. Multiple angels, because we try to uh, have several uh, eyes on the same deal. And we really like to co-invest with other people. So there's one mistake where people think that, oh my God, I want this for myself. No, I actually want to have other people in. So what's the first thing I do when I have a cool, cool deal? That is to call some of my business angel friends, which I trust, and maybe Precede Ventures also and said, hey, is it something for you, right? Pre-money valuation is really you know, up for discussion. Um, most of them I see is in the range of five to 20 million kroner. You also see more and more convertible notes, but many of them are also capped because if you take that risk up front, of course, it needs to be capped on something. Where to find them? Um, as I said, uh, angels that have invested in similar deals, you can find them uh, basically uh, on LinkedIn, the startup media, or in the company register. The good thing in Denmark is all ownership registers are public. So if you want to see who actually owns a company, a startup you know, you just go into CVR register, right? Thereby you can also see who are the angels that are invested in that company. And then also net networks that Denban and Keystones are also having their own network. So what often happens is uh, that um, people need more money than we have, right? That's why we have venture capital. I will not go too much into venture capital because that will actually also be the topic of Alexander. I will just say that most startups are not suitable for venture capital because we don't have what they're looking for. And that suits so well what Ale I know Alexander will be talking about. I'm just saying out of my 13 investments, I think I only have venture capital in three or four. Not because I don't want it, but because it's not suitable for venture capital. They're looking for something very specific thing. Uh, and also have in mind that venture capital is really, really different kinds of capital. So there's a, different, there's a difference between uh, investing 20 million euro and investing 100,000 kroner, 100,000 euro. So reach out to funds that are actually realistic for you. So if you're really, really early stage, you should of course not invest out to funds that invest normally $20 million. They don't want to talk to you because you're way, way too early. By the way, you also get the slides afterwards. Of course, you feel free to take pictures, but you also get the slides afterwards. Um, 
so, okay, maybe you got venture funding, maybe you didn't. You maybe got angel funding and you have used your own money and your uncle's money, then what? Then there is the fiat um, um, death, uh, um, um, value of death. Basically mean that in the beginning it's relatively cheap, right? Because in the beginning you are sitting at home, then you sit at Symbion, but you get a cheap office, uh, you don't have that much cost. Suddenly, you're actually going out, for instance, if you do software, you're actually going out and do a real product. Maybe if you're being biotech, you're actually having clinical trial costs, and that's really so costly. So, how to avoid this? Well, it might make sense for the public to actually invest in startups. Because I'm, I'm actually an investor in an early stage biotech uh, startup. I think this guy is brilliant and he has excellent preclinical data. It's cancer immunotherapy. According to statistics, what is the chance that this product will come to the market and become a real product? Any guesses? I saw a statistic today, I'm a little bit depressed. 3.6%. So there's a 3.6% chance, according to statistics, that this brings to the market. What will it cost? They would need to raise $330 million at least to run a, uh, How much do you think I get diluted? A lot. So honestly, from, from my perspective, it doesn't really make sense, right? But there is so many spillover effects to society that it might make sense for society. Because even if this product fails, it has generated a lot of data that is valuable, etc., etc. So what you see all over the Western world is actually that um, the public is investing in startups, even for-profit startups, and it actually makes sense. So how is the landscape now? As, as Crystal said, um, until December 31st, we had these innovation centers that were really driving a lot of the investments. I think you did 51 investments last year. Uh, in comparison, I think, if you take the public or the private VC funds, then maybe they did 20 investments last year. I don't know, something like that. Now we have a new regime where basically, and that's my very simplified version of this. So we have the soft funding, meaning where the public is not taking equity, giving you grants. 90% of that, I would say, is innovation fund. Um, how many of you have applied for InnoBooster? Yeah, InnoBooster grants, both the small and the big one. They also have the InnoFounder, where the graduates can go out now, and they have the InnoExplore from the researchers, right? So that's the soft funding with the grants. And then you have the hard funding, meaning uh, investments, either as loans, as uh, convertible loans of equity, that is handling by VEX fund um, in different, in different uh, phases. Um, and I will say one of the biggest mistakes that many early stage startups do is that they don't understand the opportunities to raise this kind of funding. Right? And it's really great. There's nothing better coming to a pre seed vendors than me and say, hey, Nebulai, we actually got 50% of, of, of our costs covered by Innovation Fund. Or that if you invest, then I know VEX Fund would also invest, right? So have that in mind, that we actually like collaborating. Um, it's also having outside Denmark. One of my companies, we got an EU grant of 18 million kroner, right? A grant, not an investment, a grant. Uh, that company would not have been alive if we didn't have that grant. Um, I'll do very quick on two other things. Why not crowdfunding, Nikolai? Why aren't you talking that much about crowdfunding? And that is because crowdfunding is really for a niche group of startups, especially when you talk the reward-based early ones, right? So I could say, how many of you men have the bad uh, sperm quality? Can I see your hands? <laughs> Why not? I actually know in here there will most likely be 10 men in here that have been in fertility treatment. Most likely. It's the biggest taboo. So there's an example of something that you can't crowdfund, right? We actually try to do it. It doesn't work. Right? Uh, my friends would not even like my Facebook page because, you know, Nicola, if I like that face, you know, other people think, you know. So, so, so if you, yes, if you have a consumer electronics divide like Airtame, or something like that. Yes, you can crowdfund it. If you have Plato Science, which is one of my investments, actually also with Pre-Seed, yes, you can crowdfund it. But if you have a B2B software for the insurance industry, you can't crowdfund it. So yes, it's relevant for some. 
Why not banks? Because banks have no upside when they give you a loan. Can you imagine if I gave a loan of 100,000 kroner to Peter from Trustpilot? And then he came back to me, you know, I'm a banker, a few years later, Nikolai, here is it with interest. Now we get 125,000 back. Simply the risk reward is not, is not suitable. In other words, banks should not give you money. And if any one of you are hearing that Sparno, or that is my bank, is giving startups money, uh, please let me know because then I'll switch bank. Because these banks that did that, what were they called? Roskilde Bank, Islande Banki, Færøske Banki, they don't exist anymore. That's for a reason. So what I will say at the end is that remember which phase you're in with, with your startup and remember what you have to offer. Remember that VCs are looking for something very different than, than angels. And remember that also public funding is a big part of that. But often it starts with someone who trusts you already. And remembering that we are honestly all lemmings. So there's nothing harder than getting the first business angel on board. But when you have three business angels, all their friends want to invest because they think it's a good deal. So it's really a way where we both collaborate for good reasons, but there's also a lemming effect in this for sure. So um, what did we learn today? We learned about, uh, we start from the beginning about what, what uh, Peter said, tells about all the mistakes they've done and how important it is really to understand what investors are looking for. From Alexander, we learned about um, what VCs are looking for, and I think it also reflected quite well in, in Peter's presentation about that they're looking for something really specific, specific. So know how you think, how they think, before you take your money. I uh, explained a little bit about the overall landscape. I think of those, we have the angels, VCs, but we also have the public support money, which you should really look into. And it often starts with people that know you. Um, then angels is is really a wide group of people that have all kinds of motivation. Some want to be really rich or richer, and some are in it for all other reasons. Um, I think that's the main list. And no. Okay, yeah. So remember, remember one, one back. Where's the figure? The Peter has it. He steals everything. Okay, so I think my first part here was about that often there's different stages of fundraising and then often start with someone that knows you. I talked about the fact that we all like to share risk and that goes from angels that would like to invest together. It goes from VCs that are looking into what other VCs are doing and it goes into when VCs and angels are talking together. It's much easier getting an early stage uh, VC when you have angels on board. And by the way, it's also much easier to have uh, public support because they will also ask themselves, well, we know expert in this industry, uh, but then you have investor XYZ. So remember, it all is again like the stepping stones Peter mentioned. Alexander about VC, Peter you know, we've talked about. And we have next event is the open door event we have on April 24th where you can basically get 30 minutes of uh, free feedback on the idea. It's not to pitch, it's not to invest. It's the brutal and very honest opinion. And again, it's just opinion, what we think. You can sign up or apply at Pre-Seed Academy. We also have our next uh, Pre-Seed uh, Startup Talk in May 5th, something like that, beginning of May. Uh, when you, that will be announced soon. So stay for our final beer, and uh, that's all. And thanks a lot for Peter for coming and for Alexander for talking about... <laughs>